Well, hello and welcome. This is Insight with Political Tools, the travel company run and led by reporters around the world. Lindsay Hilsom is one of the UK's most recognised foreign correspondents. She is Channel 4's, Channel 4's news international editor and has returned from Afghanistan just under a year after the Taliban's takeover there. While the regime itself is stable, the country is in a profound economic crisis. Much of that stems from its relations with the outside world and the burning issue is girls' education and the Taliban's decision back in March not to reopen girls' secondary schools. So that is inevitably part of our focus here now. Hello and welcome, Lindsay. Thank you very much, Nick. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, the decision on girls' education has obviously has dominated the headlines and caused uh, disappointment for many Afghan women and not to mention foreign governments and donors. But I'm interested in what's behind the Taliban's considerations and what their priorities are. And we'll come to that in a second. But um, you had an eventful time and you got back. When did you get back? I got back on Thursday. So I came back from Afghanistan. You, go, you fly via Dubai. And so I came on an overnight flight from Dubai. So Afghanistan, a country in turmoil. And um, I landed in a country in turmoil as well. So I touched down in London and, you know, turned on my phone, as we journalists do, you know, what's happening, what's happening? And between, between touchdown and the gate, two British ministers resigned. Uh, between the gate and baggage reclaim, another went. Between baggage reclaim and the taxi, another went. And by the time I got home, another three had gone and the prime minister. So I don't know if that's a, if that's a record. <laughs> The fall of the regime, except in this case, somehow or other, the prime minister manages to stay in office. So quite, quite incredible. A failed revolution, perhaps, in some ways. <laughs> um, so just, just to, what, you've covered Afghanistan over quite some time, and you were, at, you were there just after the fall of Kabul and the Taliban's takeover. So you're in a position to assess things over time, um, and you've reported on it frequently. Can you, can you give us some idea of the, of the difference you saw going back this time? And just for example, in, were you mainly in Kabul? Did you travel out a bit as well? Yeah, so look, I was in um, Afghanistan in May last year before the Taliban fall, and then we were pretty much stuck in Kabul because it was so dangerous. And you couldn't drive out, for example, to Wardak, um, you know, which is just outside of Kabul. It's, um, you know, a couple of hours and you just couldn't go because you'd be blown up by roadside bombs because the, the war was really intense at that point between the Taliban and the, the Afghan government, previously between the Taliban and the, and the Americans. And then when I got there in September, which was just a couple of weeks after the Taliban took over, and um, there was peace. Now, I know we don't like the Taliban. I don't like the Taliban. But a lot of Afghans were just so relieved that there was peace. Mm. And we drove out to Wardak um, and just, you know, chatted to people and talked to families. We talked to this one family um, who had been, you know, they had been subject to a night raid, which is one of the most hated things, um, which was the Americans and the Afghan military together raiding a household. They took away the father, who was an old man. They were looking for the son, who was a talent. There's no question he was a member mm. of the Taliban. Um, but they took away the father and the uncle, and then another uncle died of a heart attack in the middle of the raid, and another son had been killed in a similar raid. But, you know, we talked to the, the Taliban son. He was very gracious and very nice to us. Mm. Um, there was no hatred of Westerners. Mm. There was just a huge relief about the, the end of occupation. And then we went back to Wardak again this time, so, you know, week before last, and um, still peaceful. You know, the roads, the, the Americans built all these roads, and so you have all these tarmac roads, which are quite good. But every few hundred yards, there's a bit that is just gravel and very sort of, you know, bumpy. And that's where there was a roadside bomb. So you come across those, oh, every other kilometre and sometimes mm. more than that. So the evidence of the, of the intensity of the fighting is, all, is always there. And then there's these fortresses up on the hills, which are where the Americans and then the, the Afghan military were. Um, and But again, it's still peaceful. You can still get there and you can still chat to people. You're reasonably free. But of course, the reality of Taliban rule is now beginning to settle in. I, I want to 
try and I mean square that equation. That sounds um, so. We we all thought and believed. I mean, I think some of us did um, that uh, this was necessary. We were led to believe that this was a necessary project. There was a commitment of troops to try and bring st- peace to a re- region, and that the, the idea that if the Taliban did come back, it would for, you know ferment further violence in the region, and you know internationally, you know NATO staked its reputation on trying to you know back the US's project there. So I don't, I don't, I mean, just in very simple terms, yeah. uh, what what would the Afghan people? What do they want? And what's their? Well, look, it's, it's complicated, and of course, they're yeah. you know. Um, just as there's no such thing as the British people, you know, and particularly the Tory party now, I think we have, I don't know, 12 different candidates, and then yep. the Labour Party, the Liberals, all so, so Afghanistan is no different. People have support all sorts of different people for all sorts of different reasons. There isn't one, there isn't a homogenous view. But certainly, you know, Afghanistan has a reputation, which is called, you know, the graveyard of empires. And it's true that, you know, from the first British Afghan war, which I can't remember when it is, 18 something or other, mm. second British Afghan war, 18 something else, and so on. And then the Soviets occupying Afghanistan in the 1970s, and then and yeah. then the, the Americas. It doesn't work. Yeah, it it's a simplistic work. question, um, but I mean, deliberately so in a way. But the point is that there isn't a, um, a, an armed opposition to the Taliban, and without the international presence, there is no violence. Look, there is, um, there is opposition to the there's an opposition to the Taliban in the sense that there are people who hate the Taliban. No question about that. You have Islamic State, which is more extreme than the Taliban, and they have been blowing up mosques on Fridays and so on, and there is yeah. an incipient... Well, well, they're like, they're the terrorists now. And then I think that, there, and I will talk about this more, I think that there are a lot of divisions within the Taliban. So although at the moment things are more or less peaceful, I mean, there are explosions here and there and so on, it's not perfect, more or less peaceful. I think that the potential for a civil war, which could be within the Taliban, is very large. And I think that if, you know, we have this conversation in a year's time, I think we might have a very different situation. OK, OK. I think that that's an important point. That, let, let's talk then more about the, those conditions just day to day in terms of... Um, International aid, it's limited. There is some aid as aid that's come through this winter. And that, from what I understand, has actually stemmed you know, poss- a possible famine. The, the country is aid dependent and therefore without international aid, it's in a very difficult situation. No, that's right. Now, I landed, or oh, we landed, because I'm with a television team, the day that this earthquake happened in Kostam, Paktika, which is you know north of, of Kabul. And so we had to go up there Um which wasn't easy because this is one of the least developed parts of the, the country. So we drove for about five hours up to Sharana, which is the um, the capital of Paktika. And we're talking about, you know, Kabul at this point is a pretty well-developed city. You know, it isn't skyscrapers and so mm-hmm. on, but it's got massive great wedding halls and lots of shops and neon lights and all of this kind of thing. And then you get up to Paktika and to Sharana. I mean, this is, you know, it's a small town, the you know, the roads are really terrible. It's very poor. And then we uh, went up to Guyan, which was very near the uh, epicenter of the earthquake. Oh, I mean, the roads are just terrible. You're driving on these precipitous, um, you know, inclines and you know, through riverbeds at times. So, you know, that's an indication that there really hasn't been any development. And so all these trillions of dollars that have been spent on security and aid in Afghanistan, mm-hmm. well, I have to tell you, it did not reach Guyane because, you know, it's t- almost impossible to get there. And then when you do get there, I mean, people's houses, you know, people have mud houses mm-hmm. and they fall down fairly easily. And, um I mean, we were there sort of before most of the international aid agencies got there. And there was it's quite sort of a couple of interesting things. I mean, the Taliban, the Taliban, quite a few Taliban leaders had come in in helicopters and there was divided views on this because some of them had come in. I think Khalil Haqqani, who's one of the big Taliban leaders, had come in and basically offered condolences and then, you know, shot off again. You know, people actually needed food and shelter more than mm. condolences, but some people... You know, we spoke to some Talibs who were grateful for that visit. Um, but this is where but it's a real sort of Taliban heartland. And one of the things which I really sort of touched me, I really noticed, was uh, that we found there's this little tent, um, which was a small clinic. And I started to chat to the woman there whose name was Mina. 
and she had come from Kabul. She was a nurse midwife. And she told me that she'd come from Kabul to help with a couple of colleagues. And some of the men there <coughs> had said to her, you can't treat the women because we're not going to let the women come out into the open, into this area. So you can't treat them. And so she said, OK, if you don't let me treat the women, I'm not going to treat the men either. So then there was a little sort of conflab about that. And then they thought, oh, well, okay. She said, well, well, I'll have a separate tent for the women and for the men. So you can bring the women, you know, around the back or wherever you want, but I will treat the women because that's what I'm here for. And so then that was agreed. But then I, well, then there was a whole fuss and kerfuffle about some woman who was not very far away, um, but the ambulance wouldn't go and get her. And she, you know, she had a problem that the roof had fallen in on her. And this was three, you know, we were three days after the earthquake happened. So we, Jumped So somebody had got a vehicle and we jumped in our vehicle and went behind them and uh, drove not very far, you know, 10, 15 minutes. And there was some poor woman. You know, I didn't, I never saw her. I mean, she was sort of completely swayed. But she had been trapped and then they had got her out of the trap and, and so on. And then everything was hurting. But her husband had been away. He happened to have been on a, a trip. He'd been in a cost. And until he got back, nobody would take the decision to say that she should go for treatment. And so it was three days later that she came down to it. Was apparently all her teeth were smashed. And, um, you know, she was in great pain mm. here. Um, you know, she was in a bad, she probably had broken bones. You know, she was in a bad way. And she went down and, you know, Mina and her, her colleagues were treating her. But this is an example of the kind of, um, you know, we, we don't like to use the word backward. That's seen as, you know, very prejudicial and not the kind mm. of word that we use. But you know what? It's pretty backward. It's pretty terrible. And so I think it's sort of, and so over the time, you know, international aid agencies have gone in. Taliban has doesn't have many helicopters. You need helicopters to get up to those places. But most of the helicopters, the uh, air force of the previous Afghan government flew the helicopters off, went off mm. them. So they only have, you know, half a dozen helicopters. They were bringing some aid in. But, you know, humanitarian aid can go to Afghanistan. And that's not under sanctions. It's pretty hard to work with the Taliban and it's pretty hard to get humanitarian aid to, to a place like Guyana. Yeah. I want to come back to those um, priorities, that the idea of um, the concern about women coming out to an international aid agency, a woman coming out and being treated in public and being, being an issue. But I'll come back to that in just a second because I think it's an important highlight. I think Kabul it was Kabul was sometimes uh, referred to as car bubble in yes. that it was um, had all the you know foreign it had you know huge amount of funny money foreign money and and uh, you know um, the US NATO and the the center of government there and obviously a huge center of patronage so much more money what what's it, do, do you see on the streets now you talked about things being calmer things being more peaceful but do you see um, it, what what's of commerce like is um, can you see evidence of you know um, I'm, I'm just thinking about day-to-day -day living. How are people sure. getting food on the table? What's that like? Yeah, look, commerce continues, but um, it's pretty hard for a lot of people. You see huge queues outside the banks now, and civil servants still haven't been paid. Now, civil servants were paid directly into their bank accounts under the previous government, but I'm told that they still haven't been paid because... You know, there's this difference between humanitarian aid and development aid. Now, humanitarian aid still comes in for the earthquake or for World Food Programme, you know, giving emergency food rations to the very poor. But the previous government, um, you know, Afghanistan was 80% dependent on foreign aid for its budget. And so the payment of civil servants and so on all came from money that is now not coming in, um, and including Afghanistan's own money, which is now... Mm frozen in America. So at that point, the banks were completely closed in September. They are open now, but you see massive queues. Um, and a lot of people, their main source of income is their relatives overseas who are sending in money from, you know, the UK, Pakistan, America, Australia, wherever. That's the great source. Um, you see people, there are markets where people are selling their their belongings and they're not going for a lot of money, but they're desperate like that. There are places where, you know, Afghanistan sort of depends on bread and bread is something which you buy fresh every morning. And so people would go out and buy fresh bread. And then the stuff that's stale, you know, is given to the animals. Well, there are now people who are selling stale bread.
because that's all some people can afford. So even though when you look around Kabul, you still see the neon lights, you can mm. still, you know, go to some of the same shops and so on. If you look a bit harder, the, the poverty is very, very evident. I think what the interesting thing is, but was the tragic thing here is that the the that poverty and that inability to buy bread at previous prices that it used to be is linked directly with the collapse of the previous government and also critically the collapse of the central bank. So the, yes. the, the currency has fallen. Afghanistan's reserves are held by, in large part by the United States. The United States is not releasing them. And um, there's, there are quietly negotiations going on at the moment about how those reserves might be released. Obviously, the, Af the Afghan the Taliban government wants those to be released very much. Um, and it would make a substantial difference to people's lives, not just in terms of access to spending money, but the actual the purchasing power of the currency itself. But this is where it comes to what we might find being it seems quite peculiar. What are the Afghan, what is the Taliban government's priorities? And this comes back to that village, that remote village, uh, mm -hmm. and people's primary concerns. And I know that um, uh, uh, Kabul is going to be far more liberal and people might have different concerns there. But let's talk a bit about the, the Taliban government. Why do you think they introduced that ban on secondary education? It seems a crazy thing to do, especially if you know that Western donors, and particularly the United States, are going to say, well, hang on a second, we're not going to give you any money if you go ahead and do that. The Taliban is very divided. So you have, so when I was there, there was this big meeting of the Taliban in Kabul, the biggest meeting they've had since they were last in power. And they had, I think it was 3,500 tribal elders and Muslim scholars. And the emir himself, whose name is Hibatullah Akunzada, um, apparently appeared. Now, Hibatullah Akunzada is an old man. He's in his 70s. Sorry, other people may be in their 70s, but you're not as old as him. Believe me, right. this isn't. I, he, you might feel very young at 70, 70 something, but this man is an old man in terms of his mindset. Uh -huh. He is from the past. And the Kandahari group, the group of people around him from Kandahar are very much of that old mindset, the mindset of the Taliban who were in power in the, in the 1990s until they were ousted uh, by the Americans after 9-11. And um, he... He won't appear on television. There's only like one picture of him, which was taken, I don't know how long ago, 20 years ago, and then some sort of fuzzy images. He won't appear on television. To the And so when he came up, none of this meeting was televised. And he himself, you know, you know, he's just not seen. And what that means is that a lot of Afghans think he's dead. Because Afghans have grown up in the last 20 years in a media culture. Everybody's, you know, everybody's got this. They've all got their phone. They're all scrolling like anyone else in the world. They're all playing music and they're all looking at images. And this bloke doesn't appear on the television. And therefore they say, oh, he's dead. You know, they just wheeled out some bloke with a beard. And that's what the kind of thing that Afghans will say to you. But if we accept the idea that he is alive, just not on television, he is the one who says, as they did in the 1990s, girls can't go to school. And the reason girls can't go to school is because after puberty, they can go to school, primary school, but after puberty, how will you get them to school without men seeing them? It's about the bit between home and school, the bus or the walk, because after puberty, young women should not be seen. So that is what it's about. Now, most, an awful lot of the younger generation of, of Talibs, they send their daughters to school. They think this is nonsense. They don't agree with it. And one of the things which I think is, is really important is that sometimes, you know, you doubt yourself as a journalist. Well, if you don't doubt yourself, then you shouldn't mm. be a journalist. Doubt is very important. And, you know, and sometimes I read this stuff by usually men, sort of Western men who talk about, you know, how we have to deal with the Taliban. I agree, we do have to deal with the Taliban. But they're saying, oh, you know, this emphasis on girls' education, it's a sort of the wicked white Western feminists, people like me, it's us who are emphasizing this too much. I was willing to entertain that idea until I went to Afghanistan this time. And that is what everybody is talking about. All the Afghans say, hang on, we want to send our girls to school. I was in Helmand, um, you know, which was down in the South, one of the most conservative uh, pastoring areas. And um, I had a very nice um, 
male with some Afghans, uh, very ordinary sort of middle class family. They had four grown up sons and four grown up daughters. And they're like, what do we do with our daughters? One of them's a midwife, so she can still go out and work. One's 18 and just finished secondary school. So what's she going to do with the rest of her life? They had they have different expectations, and these are not your Kabul elite. These are people in Lashkagar who, you know, they're kind of normal. And so you have the, I think, so this is a real crunch issue within Afghanistan. And on the one side, you have Hibatul Akhundzada, this old man with his mm. old fashioned views. And on the other side, you have most ordinary people, maybe not up in Paktika where the earthquake was, but most ordinary people and a large number of the Taliban. But this is an emirate, it's not a democracy. Yeah. And in an emirate, you obey the emir. That's so you- what it says. You've got m- multiple, just as a recap on that, you've got multiple sort of, um, parts to the government. You've got people who want to go back to the 1990s, to the Emirate. And at the same time, they introduced the decision on what well, they basically didn't reintroduce the school year for secondary schools for yeah. girls. Um, they introduced restrictions at roughly the same time as on, on you know, women can't drive, what people wear, men should wear beards. Did that all happen at the same time? Was that it all happened different? around the same time. So that yeah. was the assertion of the sort of Kandahari old faction, the old man faction against the others. Now, there's, you know, without going sort of too deep into the weeds of the different factions within the Taliban, but the Haqqani network, which were the ones who the Americans saw as, um, you know, the the worst of the worst. They were the yeah. terrorists. They were the yeah. people who blew up the Serena Hotel. And they were terrorists. And they took David Road, our friend, captive and they wished him off to Road Afghanistan. They took David captive and also yeah. they kidnapped people. They're appalling. But they're in favour of girls' education. They're actually much more modern than some of the others. So you're in this weird situation now. I mean, I interviewed um, a mullah who was one of the chief um, advisors in the Haqqani Network. He's a sort of spiritual advisor. He's like, yeah, of course girls should go to school. You know, things have changed. We think that they should go to school. So you have the, you know, so it's fascinating, really, Mm. and it's a conundrum. So the Taliban's divided, and the Americans and the Western powers are actually on the side of the terrorists. They're more modern. Yeah, it's, it's amazing, isn't it? Um, I'd love to get questions from people. Um, we'll, in a moment, we will move on in a bit from Afghanistan and we'll look at other areas that Lindsay's been reporting from. She spent a lot of time in Ukraine um, this past six months, so I'd love to turn to that in a second. But please, everyone, if you've got questions about Afghanistan, do get them into the Q&A, bell, uh, Q&A box now. Do not wait for the end of the hour because you will be too late. Um, I, I want to just come back to the, stick with this question one, one last time. So the, the, the point here is that it, this is not fixed. There are different movements within the Taliban yeah. and people are negotiating and it looks like they're trying to find a way out of this. Um, what, where do you think the wiggle room is? Where do you think possible solutions are? Because surely those negotiations aren't taking place without the Taliban saying, look, I think we can do X, Y or Z. Sure, but I think that this this big meeting, this lawyer Jirga, which was last week, was a setback because I think that there were a lot of people who went to that who were from the more, if I can call it, modern wing of the Taliban, um, who were hoping that that would be the moment where they could say, look, you know, we really have to do this. We really have to let the girls go to school. Um, you know, we have to be a bit more lenient on the what women were. I have to say that most women are, or a lot of women are ignoring um, what they're told to wear. I saw a lot of women in Kabul with their, you know, they're wearing a headscarf, of course, they always did, but their faces are, are showing and so on. Mm. So you don't, um, you know, not everybody obeys the, the rules. Um, but of course, there's a, the fear is the arbitrary nature by which, you know, the rules may be implemented. So you can get away with that for a month and then somebody, you know, then the religious police come and, and beat mm. you up. You never know. But I think that it was a big setback, that meeting, because it was the assertion of this old man Kandahari faction and the other factions, I think, lost out in the negotiations within the Taliban. You, so you talked about that, mechanisms. Yeah. You talked about the important point, point being how do you get young girls out of their homes and take them to the school without being seen by other people? And I think there's some um, reading that 
um, perhaps that might be a way around things that if you can, if aid agencies can, uh, and it is the money is going to be coming from yeah. aid agencies to facilitate it. Um, perhaps you could get the girls to school and they could get an education that way, but are aid agencies going to be happy to do that kind of thing? I think that's very difficult and I'm not sure that aid agencies are going to be, I mean, some aid agencies are already quietly sort of funding as they did in the nineties, you know, sort of schools within houses, Sort of secret schools for girls, but it's a bigger issue because you know what I, I in Wardak I was with a very remarkable woman called uh, Dr. Roshan at Wardak, and she's actually she hated the Americans, she hated occupation as she saw it. Uh, she gets along with the Taliban. They've made her the head of mother child healthcare, but she's also ha- um, sponsors these um, these girls' schools when she's. And she's very clear, this is essential, but also, you know, she makes the point, and this is the point that, you know, somebody within the Taliban make that, you know, in, in their system, only women should be able to be gynecologists and obstetricians. Well, if you don't let girls go to secondary school, how are you going to get the next generation of um, gynecologists and obstetricians? Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it, it's impossible. And so, you know, these are, the, these are the arguments that are being made, but um, at the moment... I, you know, and I, but I think that for aid agencies, I think it's really difficult for them to to work with the Taliban in those ways when there is so much pressure on the Taliban from within to say just let them go to school, because in a sense I think it might be a mistake for the aid agencies to collaborate with the Taliban mm-hmm. on it when there's so much pressure within Afghan society. Uh, we've got some good questions coming in, and yeah. I will just before we go to these questions. I mean, one has to. I, th- I think I'm right in saying that if you take the healthcare system, for example, for example, that is actually 75% funded by um, outside donors uh, or, or organized by the World Bank. It's a slightly different setup when it comes to education. But again, if you're mm-hmm. going to introduce these kind of um, reforms and support, yes. inevitably it has to be with with um, support. The Afghans are not going to do it by themselves. The Taliban is not going to do it by itself. Mm-hmm. So there has to be the two people, or two um, cooperation between the two. Marty Ryan, you've got a question. Go ahead, Marty. Just say where you are as well, Marty. I, I'm, in, I'm in the U.S. And could you explain, please, the current structure of the government and who holds the power or where is the power held? And then secondly, as you talk about the factions, is there any way or any possibility that the factions could come together and find some common ground or compromise? Mm-hmm. Um, the structure of government is a very good question to which I'm not sure I entirely have the answer because this is not a, a government in the sense that you or I might think of a government. It's an emirate. So basically the structure of the government is you have the emir um, who may or may not be dead. And um, so there he is, not on television. And then he has two deputies who disagree with him on any number of issues, including on girls' education both of them, as far as I know from my sources, support girls' education. And then they have ministries, and but they appoint to ministries people who are have the right sort of religious um, background rather than uh, people who are necessary. <clears throat> and one of the big problems is that the technocrats all fled. And so, you know, the people who know how to run, for example, the Ministry of Health, they're actually guy in the Ministry of Health remained, the top guy, but nearly all the others left. And uh, Ministry of Education and, you know, works or whatever you have, they all fled in September. But didn't, but didn't the sort of mid-ranking civil servants, by and large, the huge majority of the, the Afghan civil service actually stayed stayed there and the, the Taliban wanted them to servants, stay? The senior civil servants all fled, right. or nearly all fled. So you're left with the middle-ranking civil servants who never didn't really sort of have much responsibility and it's very difficult for them to know what to do because then you know in the central bank you've got a muller in charge who doesn't necessarily you, you know know how central banks function i mean government is a very complicated thing as as we know so the structure of government marty is a, is a very hard thing to answer because you have the structure of an emirate which is a structure of of power rather than a structure of actual governing and i think that this is one of the reasons that you have these edicts about beards and you know covering your face and this kind of thing because this is there is there is power of the gun and so you know there are talibs all over kabul you know roaring around in american vehicles with ak-47s um 
and, you know, with their coal around their eyes and their long hair. And they can enforce the law as they understand it, but they can't govern. And so you end up with this sort of arbitrary violence of law or semi-violence of law. We are in charge and this is how we, this is how we show that we're in charge and we show that we have power, but they can't run anything. And that's what, and that's what, you know, you're going to have a real problem with as, as time goes on. They're not about policy and governing. It's about, um, yeah, it's it's about doctrine. Power. It's about More doctrine and power. Okay. okay. And then you asked about the factions coming together. I think um, the factions have come together. The factions came together to overthrow the Americans. This is a coalition which has been very successful. It has seized power. But at, this is the point where the coalition begins to come apart because they have different views. And I think that they have different views on how you exercise power and how you actually govern. And that's why I think it will be very difficult for them. They will all say, and if you ask any of them in public, they'll say, the EMEA's word is law. We do everything that the EMEA says. It's a, you know, it's a simple system. You have, there's God and God tells the EMEA and the EMEA tells the rest of us. Hmm. But actually, that's not really how it works, and I think that they're going to come apart more rather than come together more. And we haven't really spoken about, we've spoken about it briefly. Um, uh, I mean, as I always get confused between, I shouldn't get ISIS and Al-Qaeda, um, but they, basically there, there's a radical Islamist opposition to, yeah, the, to the Taliban. And the, the, have they been targeting mainly Hazara people who they don't see they, as legitimate yes, no, There's the Islamic State Khorasan, ISK, mm. um, which is more radical. And uh, they particularly powerful in different parts of the country. And, um, yeah, they have been targeting um, Hazara people who are Shia Muslims, not Sunnis, and tend to be more liberal and dress slightly differently and look slightly different. Um, Although I think the Taliban are also, you know, very prejudiced against the Hazara mm-hmm. too. And the, the whole ethnic, yeah. there's a whole other ethnic dimension to this, which yeah. we haven't really discussed. I guess the, I guess the point is that the opposition ethnic. could come in many different forms. It can come in, very, in many yeah. different forms, but I, I don't think Islamic State has the same, um, it's unlikely to have the same reach in Afghanistan as we saw it have in Syria or in Iraq or in other places. Yeah. And I think that the... The the sort of day, the threat to stability is much more from within the Taliban. Although yeah. you could get some bits of Taliban joining up with them, who knows? Okay, I okay, should be predicting things, should I? Because it's it's always no, it's good, it's good, it's good. It's good. We'll hold you up to it in a year's time. Yes, I know. Then you're going yeah. to tell me I got it all wrong. <laughs> I'm better off telling you what has happened than what. Right. Might no, no, no. It's good. It's good. Um, Hillary Matthews, and yes, we can hear you. Good, Hillary. Uh, yes, um, Lindsay, I'm absolutely thrilled. As a Channel 4 groupie, I've watched your reports many, many, many times. I watch Channel 4 every night religiously. Um, um, I've watched your reports with total admiration. But I wonder, as regards to Afghanistan, how do you get around the country without a husband or a male member ah. of your family? Does your TV crew count as a legitimate escort? And the other question quickly is, um, with the divided Taliban opinion on girls' education, does that mean that some do continue to go to school and others don't, depending on where they live? Yeah. Um, On the first question, so in TV, you end up having quite a big team. So there's myself and a producer and a camera operator, and then we have a local producer. Um, So there's four of us and then usually drivers. So it's a mixed group. And I think that the Taliban certainly at the moment, and even back in the 90s, foreign women were treated rather differently. So of course I wear my headscarf, but I don't cover here at all. Um, but you know, I wear a headscarf and I wear a long, a long what's it, you know, a long gown thing. Um, that's fine. You know, you do what you have to do to to get the the story. But um I have to say we had a completely ridiculous thing back in September. We threw a, a good contact. We got. We were told we could go to a place where the Haqqani Network were having a big meeting. Um, and of course, this was all a bit scary because you know they're, they're the, the biggest, baddest talibs of all. So along we went, and we got there. And my producer Anna and I were the only women. And they were doing the security coming in, and they looked at us and they didn't quite know what they were going to do. So they they said, "Could we pat each other down and check that we weren't carrying any weapons?" 
And so we did. And of course, we collapsed in the giggle in the giggles. And then the Taliban collapsed with the giggles too, because it was the most ridiculous thing ever. So um, and it ticked the box, and that was the most important. That ticked the box, so that was uh, that was fine. And um, do they still some of them go to school? Uh, the answer is I don't know. I suspect that some of the Taliban uh, daughters are in school in Pakistan, but I don't know, and I suspect that they they wouldn't tell me. Right, no. great, great question, Hillary, and I'm glad that we've got the groupie here. It's an obligatory part of this. Um, uh, I think some of these questions are being repeated, so I'm going to skip over them. Let's take a question. I'm going to turn the light on in my room, so just give me one yeah, second. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So um, Simon Jackson, come to you next if we can, and um, you can elaborate on your question. Oh, go that's ahead, better. You can see me now. Yeah, go on, Simon. Um, does anyone at the moment have either the will or the ability to tackle corruption? And what does um, that mean? What does corruption mean? What, I mean, that's the. I mean, I'm being um, provocative, obviously. No, no. But obviously, so one of the reasons that um, many Afghans welcomed the return of the Taliban um, was because of the incredible corruption of the previous government. And that was one of the biggest um, complaints that Afghans had about the previous government. And, you know, the Americans, they just showered at the place with money and, you know, sometimes just cash, you know, right from the beginning, they were going around, CIA were going with, you know, around with suitcases of cash giving to warlords and so on. It was insane. And, um, and that sort of continued. And so corruption has become a whole way of, of life. And the idea of the Taliban is that they are supposed to be pure and not corrupt. But I'm afraid, as you would expect, people said to me, ah, they are already corrupt. Because, you know, there's a lot of poverty and also people expect something. They, The Taliban see themselves as um, a force that has, you know, fought against occupation and they have lost many of their own people who are martyrs to the cause and that they have suffered for the last 20 years. And now they are owed jobs, houses, money, power, all of these things. And so um, although corruption is nowhere near as bad at the moment as it was under the previous government, because there isn't so much money washing around, I was told that, you know, it was all it was already starting. And so it's, you know, I think it will inevitably grow. Okay, very good question. Um, let's take a next, the next question from Elaine. Oh, Elaine can't answer this because I know she's been recovering from COVID, uh, but I will ask a question for her. Are female judges, doctors and teachers still able to work? And if so, with what constraints? Yeah, um, female judges, no. Uh, most of the female judges... Uh, Helena Kennedy, who is an amazing um, British barrister, managed to get 300 female judges out of the country, um, which was just extraordinary, um, you know, working with people. And that was necessary because some of those judges had sent down members of the Taliban and they were definitely going to come for those, uh, for those women. And they can't practice, you know, it's Sharia, there are no female judges in Sharia. Uh, doctors and teachers. So doctors, yes. Um, and uh, doctors, midwives, nurses, all of those are practicing. And female teachers who are working in primary schools, teaching girls, um, are still are still able to work, yes. And, you know, some people, some women are able to, to work in different fields, but an awful lot of them are just stuck at home, bored out of their minds. Mm. And miserable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this good question to follow on here then from Diane, Diane Cook. Go ahead, Diane. Just say where you are as well. Yes, I'm in, in um, the UK. Um, is, is there any, do you detect anything, Lindsay, looking ahead that the, the Taliban, where do they see the country in 10 years time? And also that, is there any kind of realisation that if they do have a plan, they, they need more than relying on just 50% of the population, which happens to be male. I think in 10 years' time, they see the country as an emirate, as an Islamic emirate, which is run on, on the Sharia, where Islam is the only thing that matters, and that, uh, that is their form of 
government and that it will get purer and in their terms better as the 10 years go by. I think that's how they would see it. Um, I would say they would have fallen apart before then, but that's not what they would say. And the reliance on 50%, no, absolutely not. Um, according to their interpretation of Islam, women are not there to work or make any contribution other than to be wives and mothers. That is it. So, no. Having said that, I did say before, obviously there are members of the Taliban who are a bit different, mm -hmm. who want their girls to go to to school and and so on, but it's still pretty, it's still pretty narrow. And um, I, even the members of the Taliban who want their girls to go to school, I don't think that they think they're going to, you know, become engineers or whatever. Lindsay, did you see anything of any sort of Chinese um, presence, whether uh, diplomats, um, businesses, any any indication? I know that a lot of um, minerals, a lot of the uh, mineral exports or some of the mineral exports go to China. Yeah, I didn't see any of that um, this time. I mean, yes, I'm obviously aware that um, Chinese are very interested in the Chinese met the Taliban, you know, back when they were, came into power and and so on. But so, you know, the Chinese are certainly, um, you know, interested in extracting more in the way of minerals, but also the Chinese are also a little bit wary because uh, people from Xinjiang, uh, Uyghurs from Xinjiang have in the past been um, sheltered by the Taliban in Afghanistan. And that, of course, is a huge thing for, for China and the sort of separatist and to some extent Islamist, not entirely Islamist, I would say, um, movements within Xinjiang. So they are a little bit wary at the same time as wanting yeah. the, the commercial interests. Okay. Um, we're going to take full advantage of you here um, and we're going to um, skip. Let, let, let's talk about Ukraine, because I think probably that's the area where you spent a, a lot of the last six months. Um, you you were there when the when this most recent, basically when Putin declared his um, his special operation. Where were you at that time? Um, so on 24th of February, I was in Kramatorsk, which is in the east in uh, Donbass, which is a place which is at this point, um, very, very much threatened by by Russia. I mean, it's you know sort of one of the next two on the list of the places in the east which Russia will will you know try and try and take using its overwhelming force of artillery. Yeah. Um, are you are you planning to go back soon? What's when was and when was the last time you were there? Yeah, I'll probably go back in September, I think. Um, Channel 4 News, like every uh, news organisation, we've spent the entire foreign budget for the year in the first six months in Ukraine. And so and now, of course, we have a massive um, UK domestic story. So I'm actually looking forward to a quiet summer. <laughs> that the famous last words, it never yeah. happens, right? Yeah. I'm looking, to a quiet for a, looking forward to a quiet summer last year and then the Taliban took over in Afghanistan. Um, but I'll probably go back in September. I was there, I guess, about a month ago. Just before I went to Afghanistan, I was in Ukraine. So I've sort of spent, you know, sort of three months, I guess, in Ukraine in this year. Yeah. I do, I do want to ask a question. If this is, um, we, we've done quite a few talks on yeah. various different aspects of the, the conflict, and we spoke to Michael Kaufman, I think it was back in May, oh, and yeah. he's, yeah. A, he's a um, military analyst with the Center for Naval Affairs yeah, yeah, in Washington, yeah. D.C., um, and he, he talks about a war of attrition uh, and he sees both sides really. I mean, although the Russians have a huge amount of artillery power and overpowering in terms of material, in terms of armament uh, and, uh, and munitions that they can chuck at it, but in terms of manpower, they're pretty heavily deplete, depleted and he sees a slow, slow rolling advance. If you are in that zone, that zone that as the... As the um, you know, you, you, the, the conflict's coming nearer to you. The thing that really strikes me is how you see so many families still there. And the question that we, we've asked this question before here is why do people stay behind? Why are, they, why are they still in those apartment blocks? Why are they still in those villages? And I know you've been there and you've heard different stories. Yeah, absolutely. And I was also, I should say, I was also in Crimea and in Donetsk in, uh, in 2014 during the, you know, the first term. Um, Russian incursion and the annexing of, of Crimea and so on. I think it's a couple of things. A lot of the people who stayed are, um, are elderly and have nowhere to go and no money. Um, but there are people who support the Russians. And I, I feel that this isn't necessarily getting enough coverage. And you know, maybe that's, that's our fault. And that's also because people don't necessarily say so. 
But, you know, after 2014, when the, the Russians took a large part of the Donbass, um, the people who, the young people and the people who were pro-Ukraine, if I can put it that way, a lot of them went to Kharkiv and Kiev, they went west, they went into Ukraine proper. And a lot of the people who remained behind were quite pro-Russian. And they may be even getting Russian or Soviet pensions. And um, I think that now in these places like um, Severodonetsk and Lysychansk, you know, which are up there in Luhansk in this, which was on the sort of border of the area which Russia had previously controlled from 2014 and the, you know, the places which it's taking now. A lot of those old people are, are quite pro-Russian. And it's a really, and we're not talking about huge numbers of people. We're talking about a few thousand, but, um, but there they are. And in fact, even in Mariupol, I mean, uh, back in, um, in March, I was in a, in a car park um, where people from Mariupol were, were coming. And I met this wonderful young woman called Maria. She was lovely. And she was an extraordinary woman who'd managed to get her mother and her two daughters out. And, um, and she said, and I said, and I, I asked her about people and she said, she said, my neighbors were pro-Russian. She said, my neighbors wanted the Russians to come. She said, I can never speak to those people again. She said, and yeah. they stayed behind. And there were people, she didn't have a car. She said, people wouldn't give us a lift out because they're pro-Russian and they didn't want us to escape. And she, I mean, I, you know, her, her voice was just full of, of fury and fury and, and, and desperation of the sense of being betrayed. And I think that it's quite a complicated thing because you know, obviously the Russia, the uh, Ukrainian war aim is to get back all of their territory, and it is their territory under international law, no question. But what will that territory be? Well, it, it's ruins sparsely populated by people who don't love you, who don't love Ukraine. And that, I think, is a very complicated political thing which is not really being addressed at the moment. Mm, yeah. I mean, I have to say I'm pretty um, amazed on, on the flip side of that. I remember being in Kharkiv and in Odessa and finding people who were very outwardly pro-Russian. I remember walking through, I can't remember if it was a market in Kharkiv or Odessa, and they could hear that we were, we were, we were speaking English. They didn't they presumed that we were American and, you know, ch ch um, shouting insults at us. And then when speaking to people, you know, people were much more sympathetic to Russia. But then um, after that, you know, time period, people becoming overwhelmingly pro the Ukrainian well, government, no, you know. There's no question. Yeah. Since 2014, there's been a massive move towards being pro-Ukraine. There's no yeah. question about that. The, the, the general, all the polling and so on shows you that. But we're talking about the holdouts in yeah. places like Mariupol and Lysychansk and Severodonetsk. These... And I keep saying old people, and they are mainly older people, not entirely. Yeah. The, these people who've remained behind, I think, are largely yeah. pro-Russian. Yes. Yes, as a general rule, people have definitely gone against Russia and definitely patriotic towards Ukraine, no question. We, we've just done a tour of the Baltic states and where we were really looking at relationship with, with Russia, and we came across several Russian communities and... Um, you know, I, I asked one question too many of a young girl in a, uh, a rush. It's got a town called Visaginas, which is um, uh, linked to a nuclear power plant on the Lithuanian Belarusian border. And I asked the question, what's the situation in your household? You know, how, what's your view? What do your parents think? And she burst into tears because there's a subject they couldn't, they couldn't talk. So whole communities ripped apart. And also, I think the elder generation still watching Russian television, very, very much. much taken in by, by that thing. Yeah, that's an important, that's yeah. an important factor. Yeah. Lindsay, um, we've, we've got other things to talk about, and I still want questions to come in from people. So please do um, put questions about anything, whether it's about Afghanistan or Syria, which we may talk about in a second. Um, uh, uh, how, what keeps you going? Isn't there? Don't don't you you got? Don't you want to sort of put your feet up after some stage and just take it easy and read a few books? Is that a patronizing question as well? No, it's not a patronizing question. It's a question I ask myself. I have to say that after two weeks in Afghanistan, where you know, the roads were so appalling and then I got food poisoning and, um, you know, and then the bloody earthquake where you have to kind of scramble over all the rubble and so on. And I, as I say, you know, the roads, I felt like I've been in a tumble dry for two weeks. I did come back thinking, God, is it, <laughs> it must be mad still doing this. But um, look, there, there's nothing, there's nothing more 
fascinating than being where history is happening. And um, of course, this is why, you know, people on this call think the same, because this is why people go on your trips and why people are interested in this. this is to see it for themselves. Yeah. And if you have the privilege of seeing it firsthand, it's a, it's a hard thing to, it's a hard thing to give up. And so, and also, you know, you do see things which need exposing, you know. You do I, I do think what really does come across in your reporting, and I, I think um, that Hillary was suggesting that as well earlier, is that I think you have an ability to get out there and perhaps say things that people might not want to hear and other cover, uncover things that really matter and things that we should, but sounds uh, trite perhaps. But no, um, no, it's not trite. Yeah, it, it's, Look, you know, you know, what do we as journalists do? You know, the... The the killings by the Russians of people in Bucha, I wasn't, that was when I was unfortunately outside of Ukraine. But, you know, this is what journalists do. We uncover this stuff. It's really, it's really, really important. And then when I did go in, you know, I went to a place north of there up towards Chernobyl and I, you know, come across a woman sitting in a graveyard weeping. And then we find out the story of how the Russians killed her, her son. And, you know, this stuff matters. It's really mm. important. And um, I know, you know, when I was 21, of course, I thought that the moment I found something out and told people, then the whole world would change and everybody would, you know, do what do the right thing. Of course, I know that that's not true. But, you know, the light is better than darkness. And, yeah. you yeah. know, it's important that that woman's yeah. story be told and her son's story be yeah. told. Some people watching this might not know that you wrote a book about Marie Colville um, and um, her work, and mm -hmm. that also takes us on to Siri. Can you just talk a bit briefly about the book as well? Yeah, so, so Marie Colvin was the most fantastic, sort of the greatest war correspondent of my of my generation. And she was American, but she worked for the, um, for the Sunday Times, and she was a real, she was a sort of Martha Gellhorn type. She was glamorous and hard drinking and smoking and, all of those, all of those things, and also an absolutely brilliant reporter, and um, and she lost her eye in Sri Lanka. Or she lost the sight in her eye covering the war in Sri Lanka. She wore an eye patch. Um, she had one um, studded with rhinestones and sequins for parties. Um, and I loved her very much. And um, which doesn't mean I'm not critical of her because hmm. God, she did some. Foolish and terrible thing. She had the worst taste in men that you could ever imagine. And um, anyway, I wrote her biography. I was lucky enough to um, uh, to get access to her diaries, and she kept journals all the way through her her life, which are just incredibly revealing of her personal dilemmas as well as the times in which she she lived. Anyway, it's called In Extremis, and um, yeah, and that was and that was a way of sort of revisiting a lot of the same. Mm. Places because I, she and I were in a lot of the same places at the same at the same time, um, but without having to write about myself because I could write about Marie because Marie is much more exciting and glamorous than, than me. I haven't had you know three husbands and all yeah. that kind of stuff. I'm I'm the I'm the dull foreign correspondent. Far from it, far from it. But the, I think the thing that you both have in common is that you're determined to go back to that story, even if perhaps it's gone out of fashion. And Syria has gone out of fashion and people don't want to know about it. And I'm sure she would be there now too. Well, of course, and Marie was killed in Syria. I mean, Marie was um, killed in twenty in February 2012 in, um, in Homs in Syria, where she had gone to tell the story of how um, Assad was bombing not rebels but civilians and she told that story brilliantly but in the telling of that story she was um, she was killed and um, Marie's um, you know Marie took one risk too many and um, I'm much more cautious than she is um, and that's why I'm alive because I'm yeah. a lot more cautious than she is but yes I do believe in, in going back um, I, uh, have you been to Damascus recently? Uh, yeah, not recently. I'm banned now. I mean, because I actually was going in on the, the government side um, for quite a long time, but I'm banned now because I think the last time I was in Syria, gosh, I can't remember, but it was when the I was in Rojava, which is the sort of Kurdish area, um, when the Islamic State was being defeated in a place called Baghouz and when, when Raqqa fell. That was when Islamic State was in control of part of, of Syria. And so that was the last time um, this time I was there. But, you know, so what's happening now? So the Russians um, tried to veto um, this week um, a UN resolution which allows food to go across the border from Turkey to the part of the country which is still not under um, government control, Syrian government control. There's still one sort of enclave. 
and um, it's you know people that are entirely uh, dependent on international aid, and the Russians tried to veto it. In the end, what's happened is that they've agreed that it can continue for another six months, whereas the rest of the Security Council members wanted it to continue for a year. So the food is still getting through. But you know the fact that we, you, you know, I always feel that being a a foreign correspondent like me, it's like, it's like being a faithless lover, you know, you go from one thing to the next and then I feel guilty about Syria. And then when I'm in Ukraine, I feel guilty about Afghanistan. And when I'm in Afghanistan, I feel guilty about Ukraine. But you can't, and Channel 4 is a very small outfit. We're not like the mm. BBC, which has people everywhere. It's sort of up to me and a couple of, a couple of others. Um, and you can't do everything all the time. But I do think it is important to you know, to, to not let things go and to go back and visit, which is why I was determined to go back to Afghanistan just now instead of just always sticking with Ukraine because you just can't let, you can't just let, let it drift away. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, I mean, uh, to, uh, what you do do is brilliant. And obviously you can't, you're not a huge organisation. You have to sort of cherry pick your, your mm -hmm. stories. Um, Hillary, you've got a quick follow-up question there too. Hillary Matthews. Hillary must be away from the computer. She's, she's basically asking about Shireen Abu Akhtar. Oh, you, I wondered, yeah. uh, there, yeah. I wondered if you knew, um, uh, I, think her name, I think I've got her name right, Shireen Abu Akhtar, yeah. because uh, you're talking about the, and I'm just amazed about the female journalists producing this wonderful stuff, and she was one of them. Absolutely. I didn't know her personally. I knew her by reputation. And for those who don't know, she was an extraordinarily brave Palestinian journalist who was um, killed by an Israeli bullet um, while covering Janine about, um, I suppose, about a month or six weeks ago. But one of the things that we have done, Hillary, uh, myself and Lise Doucette of the BBC, who you're probably familiar with, and Jane Wellesley, who was uh, Marie Colvin's best friend, we set up a small org organisation called the Marie Colvin Journalists Network, where we provide support to young, to female journalists in the Arab world. Because often female journalists in the Arab world have particular, you know, problems which we don't necessarily have they may you know it's not it's not just the the opposition of, of the governments trying to stop them or warlords trying to stop them it's quite often their own family trying to, to stop them and they often don't have much support and um, so we provide support in the way of hostile environment training and um, counseling if they need it and sometimes we provide practicals in like body armor and um, it, you know or sometimes we if they suddenly have to go into hiding or something, we try and help them find a way of, of doing that. So that's something that we're doing mm. in, in Marie's name, which I think is really important because one of the things that sort of changed a lot in, in my time as a journalist is that increasingly people are telling their own stories. It's not just foreign correspondents, you know, white people like me going into somebody else's country, yeah. but people telling their own stories in their own, in their own countries, in Africa, in Asia and the Middle East. And I think that that's really, really important and we should do everything we can to support them. Uh, this is, um, uh, there is a sketch on TikTok that um, one of our followers um, showed me, and it's a, I think it's a Kenyan reporter doing a mock report on the archipelago in the um, Middle North, uh, which is a regime run by a blonde um, tyrant, um, right. and the government is collapsed, and um, there's a great, great concern for democracy. And, oh, brilliant. Um, so <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It's yeah. about time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. yeah. Thank you. Listen, Lindsay, this has been absolutely wonderful. I'm very grateful for the time that you spent with us and uh, jumped very successfully from one place to another. It's been a real privilege listening to you, and I know that everyone here in the UK who knows you at Mars and loves your reporting, keep going mm -hmm. at it for as long as you can. Thank you. That's very kind of you, Nick. And it's very, um, very um, happy to sort of e-meet all of you guys. And thank you very much for, for coming on to this and, uh, and listening and asking your great questions. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, everyone. Thank you to Lindsay Hilson, Channel 4 News' international editor. Um, we are... Um, we've got one more talk this week, uh, and that's of Holger uh, Runemar, who's a, an investigative journalist in Estonia. And a lot of his work has been looking at sort of Russian subterfuge uh, in the Baltics, and he looks at organised crime as well. That's going to be a, a great conversation, and I think that's at 1 p.m. UK time on Thursday. But do check your, your emails there for the local times. We'll have two more talks, at least two more talks in the rest of the month, and I will send you more details on that shortly. Thank you very much indeed, everyone, for joining in. Um, we will see you all again online very shortly. Thanks. Bye for now. Bye-bye.